Welcome to the Women of Ambition podcast. I'm your host, Alyssa Calder-Hume. The Women of Ambition podcast is a place where we explore ambition. First, the radical act of acknowledging it within ourselves. Second, allowing space to explore what ambition means for each of us. And third, moving forward with intention. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. I'm interjecting in the middle of our ambitious relationship segment to celebrate a couple of milestones and then to also celebrate Women's History Month with a really awesome story about a badass woman in my history. So here we go. This week marks the one year anniversary of the Women of Ambition podcast. I am so proud of what this podcast has become. I'm so grateful for all of our listeners and all of our contributors and guests. I have learned so much from this process and I love hearing feedback from all of you listeners on how the conversations are helping you and the thought processes and um, new ways of thinking that you've come up with. So thank you so much for all of that awesome feedback. Here are some fun stats to go with the podcast. We are in the top 10% of global podcasts, according to Listen Notes. Currently, there are 2,793,588 podcasts in the world, and we're in the top 10%. So thanks for making that happen here. Uh, The Women of Ambition podcast is listened to in 30 different countries. Our most popular podcast, podcast episode is season one, episode 10. And that's my personal story with ambition. Um, Along this path to becoming a podcaster, which I had never previously planned on, I kind of neglected in the first season to really add any of me into those episodes beside the little tidbits that you get throughout the interviews. And so episode 10 of season one is me kind of sharing my journey with ambition and why it's important to me. The One of the episodes that I feel like needs love and is one of the most epic ones is also in season one. It's our fourth episode with Carissa Lemmy, and it's about reforming the foster care system as well as her experience returning to full-time work. It's a really good episode. Um, I'm not sure why it just didn't get as many listens that first round, but definitely go check that one out. Um, So those are our most popular and our most underrated episodes. I hope that you go check those out and enjoy them. Currently, we have 28 episodes and three seasons. And I just love watching all of those numbers go up, (laughs) all the listens and the interactions on social media and Instagram. I love watching all that grow and knowing that there are so many of us ambitious women having this conversation because there really isn't another space like this out there where these conversations are happening. And so thank you so much for participating here. Thank you for all of those who've been guests, who've contributed your own stories, because obviously I'm really passionate about this. Otherwise I wouldn't be spending so much time on this project the last year. Okay, now we're gonna move on to a little story time. This is the story of one of my great, 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 great grandmothers, Susanna North Martin, who was convicted of being a witch and hung in the Salem witch trials back in the late 1600s. Susanna was born in England in 1621. That's just one year after the first pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock. She moved to Salisbury, Massachusetts in 1689 at the age of 18 years old, where she met her husband and had eight children. I love the descriptions of Susanna as an adult because they could literally be describing me. (laughs) So if you're wondering where Alyssa gets the audacity, it's from my great-grandmother from 400 years ago. Descriptions of Susanna say that she was short, slightly plump, active, and of, quote, remarkable personal neatness. She was also said to be very outspoken, contemptuous of authority, and defiant in the face of slander, which unfortunately followed her around for many years. She was also viewed by others as a troublemaker, (laughs) and her name appears many times in court records prior to the Salem witch trials. Um, I also found an account that reported that she had an argumentative nature. Unfortunately, she endured 25 years of rumors and accusations, multiple court appearances. She was accused of being a witch three times. 
Fortunately, the first two times, her husband was able to step up and defend her and get her free, which is the privilege of having a husband at the time. Um, At this point, if you'll remember your American history, the church and the government were essentially the same thing. And these are very, very small communities. This is just like 50 years after the pilgrims first arrived in Massachusetts. In 1686, her husband passes away. And this is when the third accusation of her being a witch comes to light. And she no longer has her husband to defend her in court. At this point, she is 70 years old. Now, a 70-year-old woman now would be probably considered old, but a 70-year-old woman in the late 1600s, she was old, okay? (laughs) She was old. She was surviving those winters one after another, after another, after another. And here she is, 70 years old, being accused for the third time of being a witch. This woman who has rubbed everyone the wrong way for several decades, who is outspoken, contemptuous, (laughs) argumentative, a troublemaker. Finally, she is a widow. She's destitute. She's alone. Finally, they can nail her. There's also some backstory that she had some legal claim to a very large inheritance that was able to be wrangled out of her control, thanks to the government and the church that wanted to have her wealth. And so there is an argument to be said that she was accused of witchcraft to get rid of her so that they could legally and completely have access to her land. So she gets accused in 1692. Reverend Cotton Mather, yes, that Reverend Cotton Mather, the one who went all up and down the East Coast accusing women of witchcraft and killing them, is accusing her. And this is what he has to say about my great-grandma. This woman was one of the most impudent, scurrilous, wicked creatures of this world, and she did now throughout her whole trial discover herself to be such a one. Yet, when she was asked what she had to say for herself, her chief plea was that she had led a most virtuous and holy life. According to historians, if she had just admitted to being a witch, she would not have died. But she never did that. She never gave up. In fact, in the trial, every time they accused her, of being a witch, or someone would come up and would suddenly have a fit on the floor of the courtroom, spasming and gurgling and making all kinds of weird noises. She would laugh in their freaking faces. She laughed, dude. She's laughing in the trial. This very old woman is laughing in the face of this entire community, her church, her government, her friends, her family, accusing her of being a witch. She's laughing in their faces. There are also counts that say that she chose to mutter under her breath just to freak them out, just to freak the crowd out, to think that she might actually be a witch. And then she turned around and did the thing that a witch was not supposed to do. She quoted from the Bible at length from memory repeatedly. This was one of those things that witches were not supposed to be able to do. And so in doing it, she was building her own defense. She also never accused the other women of girls of witchcraft. She did not turn on them. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough. They did condemn her to death for being a witch. As she was being carted away up to the top of the hill, the reverend was talking to her and was pleading with her to just admit her wrongdoing and admit her that she was a witch and that he could save her from death. And she wouldn't do it. And not only that, she told the reverend, if you condemn me to death, you will die by choking on my blood. And apparently the story goes that he died from an internal hemorrhage choking on his own blood. So she was executed at Salem, July 19th, 1692, a martyr of superstition. History now views her as this hardworking, honest woman who was just trying to live her life and was tried over and over again because of prejudice, because she wasn't fitting in with the mold, because she questioned authority, because she stuck up for herself. She was allowed no counsel. She was her own lawyer, and her answers are remarkable for their independence and clearness. (laughs) 
March is Women's History Month in the United States, the UK, and Australia. This is a time where we get to look back and remember all the amazing contributions of women to society. This, <laughs> this is, these are the types of women that we get to honor in our his, Women's History Month. These are the stories that I am telling my children. And there are so many other in my history. And there's so many others in yours. And if you have ancestry from the Salem Witch Trials, there is a very good chance that she is one of your ancestors. If you have um, early pilgrim heritage, she has she had eight children. There are descendants of her. I don't know of any other uh, accused and killed witch who has descendants currently because she was so much older than the women and children who were condemned. But these these are the stories that we get to tell when we focus on Women's History Month. And I get to dig out these histories from my own family, the little snippets I get here and there. Because frequently, at least in my family history, the women's stories aren't told. Those journals aren't kept, or the women aren't writing them, or I don't know. The women are too busy taking care of everything else. I don't know. But the women's stories just aren't there. And so when I find one, oh, it's so valuable. I had the opportunity to go and visit Boston a year ago and to walk all over these grounds where my ancestors lived and where Susanna lived and to go to these streets that are named after her family and visit these places. And it was, it was beautiful and powerful and amazing. And this is just one woman in history that I get to learn and be from that I can identify with and who can explain a little bit about where this Alyssa's personality came from. And I can't help but think, what's the legacy I'm leaving behind for my children? I can't help but think about all of my guests and the legacy that they are creating right now for their children. I can't help but think, what do I want for my children? Am I living my life that way right now? If I want my daughters especially to live in their truth, to follow their passions, to make an impact on the world and to be contributors to society, what am I doing now to contribute like that? What is my shining moment? And I know that Susanna wasn't reaching out for this opportunity, but clearly she knew who she was. Clearly she spoke up for herself and she spoke her truth. And the result of that is this incredible story of power. And you know what? If she hadn't been accused of witchcraft, I would not know her story. I would not know that there was a woman 400 years ago in my own family line that I could identify with and learn from. And it's really sad that the only reason I have this story is because of the witch trials and the accusations. But I'm really grateful for this history because it's bland, man. It's bland when we don't get to hear straight from women's mouths about their own histories. And it propels me to continue to create this podcast and to continue to document the stories of women and continue to help make space for more of us to live in our truth and to do the things we feel called to do and to live the life that I want for my children and set an example because of the way I'm living now. That fuels me. That fires me. And the one thing I really love about these things is that it gives me an opportunity to share my story in a way that will stand the test of time. Um, I've told my husband, like, if I die, I want you to make sure you save my podcast for our kids because it contains my core values. It contains a lot of my stories. It contains my history. And this is a project that I'm really passionate about. And it's, it encapsulates so many of the things that are important to me that I would want to pass on to my children. And so when we're looking at Women's History Month, I can't help but look at all of the stories of our guests in the last year and think how they are currently living their children's history. When their children are adults, the history that they're going to be reviewing is what we are doing right now. March you know, 2040 is going to be reviewing what is happening in our day right now and viewing podcasting or journalism or writing or any of the projects and passion things that we do as adults, viewing it with that lens that we are creating history, it changes the tone for me when I'm deciding what to do with my life. Um, 
one of the things that really got me off my butt (laughs) to figure out what I want to do with my life is sitting down and realizing that one of the things I want, especially for my daughters, is I want them to live a life of knowing their passions and living in them. I want them to be world contributors. I want them to have an impact in whatever way they choose to do that. And I want it to be concrete and meaningful for them. How can I possibly hold that as a value if I'm not actively pursuing that for myself? I see this pattern with women where where we want our children to have the best life possible. We want them to have all these opportunities, but we neglect to give them to ourselves and to seize those opportunities for ourselves. And I think we need to do a little bit of reparenting for ourselves. We've had this the last several episodes focusing on relationships with self and relationships with children. And when I think about myself the way a parent would, I want me, (laughs) I want me to go and get all the education I really want. I want me to have a job and a a life that is in alignment with my values and my passions. I want me to be happy. I want myself to have scream joy. I want myself to travel. I want myself to stretch and to grow and not to get stuck in the grind of motherhood and the grind of social expectations and just be abandoning myself over and over again for my children. I don't want my children to have that life of self-abandonment. I don't want my girls especially. I have three daughters. I don't want them to fall into that trap of living for their children's dreams. And so in order to break that cycle, I have to start now living my life and modeling that for them. And I think that is one of the greatest gifts I can give them. And of course, you know here, I'm not talking about abandoning our children to go follow every single whim. I'm not talking about not parenting my children so that I can go be selfish. That is not at all what this is. This is setting an example for my children. It's living by, you know, do as I say and as I do. And if I can model that, then my children are going to be so much better off than than I was. They're going to be so much better off than I am where I didn't really have a model of someone really living in their truth and and living authentically and taking full ownership over their actions. And so that is the thing that I can give my children. And when I think about Women's History Month, these are the stories that stand the test of time. It's women who have made more space for other women. It's mothers and aunts and cousins and grandmothers and sisters and friends and and all of these amazing women who have fought for our rights, who have made space for each of us. I mean, we know that when women are involved in government and in rulemaking, that everyone wins. This isn't just women for women. This is women for all. When women win, we all win. Okay. That sounds like That sounds like an office episode. Anyway, I think that's my first office uh, reference on the podcast, which I feel like is pretty good for me. So I'm I'm kind of obsessed with it. So with win, 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 we all win. Um, (laughs) When women win, we all win. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Women of Ambition podcast. I'm your host, Alyssa Calder-Hume. Please leave a review or share with a friend if you found this helpful and follow us on Instagram at Women of Ambition podcast.